Welcome to the Collaborative Core Center for Clinical Research Speaker Series. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today for the presentation. Today we have two presenters, Dr. Stuart Warden, a professor of physical therapy and the Associate Dean of Research in the School of Health and Human Sciences at the Indiana University School of Medicine, and Dr. Sharon Moe, the Associate Dean of Clinical and Translation Research, co-director of the Indiana Clinical Translational Sciences Institute, and the Division Director of Nephrology at the Indiana University School of Medicine. Their, presenta today, uh, excuse me, their presentation today is titled Assessing Musculoskeletal Health, the Indiana University Function, Imaging, and Tissue Core, also known as the FIT Core. Doctors Warden and Mo, whenever you're ready to start, feel free. Thank you, and thanks for organizing these uh, presentations. So Stuart and I will be tag teaming throughout the presentation today, and we are speaking on behalf of our uh, other leaders in our ICMH Clinical Research Center, which is the Indiana Core Center for Clinical Research, um, including myself and Stuart, and then Dr. Mike Econs, Dr. Eric Emmel, and Dr. Antonella Chiacci. So the mission of our core, of our entire um, P30, is to provide the training and resources to enhance clinical research in musculoskeletal disorders through the use of state-of-the-art technologies to define, characterize, and measure genotypes and computable molecular functional and morphologic phenotypes. So as with all of your cores, there, um, there are three. Uh, we have our resource core, which we have called the MSK FIT core, the FIT standing for function, imaging, and tissue. This is a collection of human data, and we also provide consultation for the correct collection of samples during human trials to prepare for future omics. The methodologic core is what we call BDO or the big data and omics core. And we use electronic health records or medical records to look at patient information as it relates to outcomes. So all of the data that we collect in the FIT core is linked to outcomes like fracture, death and hospitalizations through the methodologic core. And then of course we have the administrative core. So our overarching goal is to actually characterize phenotypes. Um, and this is uh, through a number of ways. So what we'll be talking about today is mostly what we would call a functional phenotype, physical function and imaging. But we also have the ability to do a computable phenotype through what we just described as the clinical uh, omics core, our BDO core, through Reagan Street Institute. Reagan Street Institute is a data warehouse organization that allows us to access medical health records, electronic records from all over the state of Indiana. All of the patients that participate in the FIT core also contribute biosamples, blood, plasma, and DNA pellets to our Indiana Biobank. And this allows future molecular and genotyping cores, or phenotyping, sorry, genotyping and molecular phenotyping. Um, and so basically all of these types of phenotypes will allow us to enhance musculoskeletal clinical research by really characterizing this very broad group, group of diseases known as musculoskeletal disorders. So using this broad group of diseases, we are gonna use a variety of methods that will allow us to better phenotype. So the overarching goal of the FIT core um, is the physical function imaging and tissue is collection of human data and to provide the consultation as we mentioned. So I will uh, hand off to Dr. Warden who is going to talk about this core. He is the PI on this resource core. Go ahead, Stuart. Thanks, Sharon. So uh, like uh, Dr. Moe said that uh, I lead the, uh, the MSK um, FIT core and again, it's the function imaging tissue. So we'll go through what that means. And overall, it's to provide access to physical function testing and also training in the outcome measures of physical function, uh, imaging modalities related to musculoskeletal health, um, which are quantitative sort of modalities, which we'll talk about. And then also the expansion of specimens related to, to musculoskeletal health in the Indiana Biobank. So we're physically located um, within uh, IU Health University Hospital, which is one of the major hospitals on the Indianapolis uh, IUPUI campus of, of Indiana University. And 
we were fortuitous uh, when we, we got this funding that we, um, we found some space that was adjacent to our CTSI that had just become vacated. And so we, we sort of moved into that space and, and piggybacked onto the uh, Clinical Research Center of the Indiana CTSI. And that's really been uh, a mutually beneficial um, arrangement uh, because all the subjects that come through the FIT core um, count towards the CTSI numbers, but we also have access and we can recruit subjects from the CRC. So when subjects, patients come in for different studies, um, we'll often go around and, and recruit them to come back to, to our rooms at the back to do our functional testing and imaging uh, while they're waiting for other procedures and so on. So we've been able to collect data from a number of different um, sample populations. So who do we actually see? Um, so we have a, an umbrella or a centralized IRB, which basically allows us to recruit and test anybody aged over five years and any level of function. And so it's a fairly broad and open uh, IRB. Um, and you know, we, we basically say, if you, you have a pulse, then we can test you um, and you're five years older. So we, we test people who come off the street, uh, general population who come in purely just to do the fit core testing. And then we also have uh, patient populations that, like I said, we recruit from the uh, Clinical Research Center, but we also have an ever increasing number of uh, research studies now that um, have, are sending their subjects through the FIT core um, and using us as an actual resource, you know, like we should be, a, a resource to collect, um, to collect the data. And a number of these uh, patient studies uh, have uh, put the FIT core in their, their grant applications and subsequently got funded and, um, and you know, it, it's really um, building uh, over the last few years. So how many subjects have we actually seen? Uh, so we, we started around November when our, uh, 2017 when our funding sort of started. We had a little bit of a ramp up period um, in terms of locating space, uh, renovating equipment and, and hiring and so on. And you can see around about March 2018, we really um, started in earnest. Um, and so thus far we've recruited uh, uh, 20, just over 2,500 individual subjects. And there's been nearly 3,000 uh, actual visits. Um, we, we are doing a lot more or starting to bring back a lot more people who, who came through initially uh, for repeat visits. Uh, so we're trying to collect some more longitudinal data as opposed to cross-sectional data. Uh, you can see around March 2020, when COVID hit, uh, we, we shut our doors uh, like a lot of uh, facilities did. Um, and we shut them for a period of time. Um, around uh, in the fall of 2020, we did open up again with restrictions. And we opened up primarily for those studies that were longitudinal studies that had already had subjects come through the FIT core that needed to be retested. Um, so we, we were trying to support the researchers who had their longitudinal studies um, affected by COVID so that we, we didn't fall behind in their, in their assessments. In terms of age groups, uh, you can see that we have a, a fairly broad uh, range of age groups. We don't have a lot of uh, people under 18 at the moment, and that's something that, that we'd like to address. Um, we definitely have a, a, a group of people in their 20s being on a college campus or a community campus. Um, we, we definitely have an uh, attraction to the 20-year-old the, you know, population. Um, we also have a spike around, uh, around 60 years of age, and, and that's primarily um, due to the fact that we give free DEXA scans um, that a lot of people uh, particularly white females come through to get a DEXA scan to, to check their bone mass. So what do we collect? So again, it's function imaging tissue. In terms of the function side of things, our goal is to provide standardized assessments and also a data entry platform for those outcome measures. Uh, and also to train other investigators in how to do these measures in a standardized way. And so we have a standardized test battery that uses a, a, a set script, set procedure, uh, to try and reduce variability um, and try and get the most precise sort of outcomes as we can. And the current battery um, that subjects do includes the short, short physical performance battery, uh, which is your usual gate speed over four meters, uh, the chair stand test, 
And we actually do that uh, two ways. We do a 30 second chair stand. So how many times you can stand from a seated position in 30 seconds. During that 30 second test, we also time the first five. Uh, so we do the five time repeat chair stand. So we, we're trying to hit both, both types of chair stand tests in a single, in a single uh, repetition or single test procedure. Uh, static standing balance, uh, we do that actually on a force platform. So we also measure um, center of gravity um, uh, sway or, or um, uh, motion. Fast gate speed, grip strength, um, six minute walk distance um, as our sort of endurance sort of outcome. Um, I also mentioned on the chair stand um, test, we, we do that on a force platform as well. So we measure actual uh, power during the chair stand. So we're getting a measure of, of muscle power. So all subjects that come through the fit core have that, that standard battery. Uh, we do tweak it based on individual investigators uh, who want to have different measures um, in their individual studies. So uh, investigators can ask to have different tests done, but most of the time we, we do that, that standard battery that hits most of those uh, domains of strength, power, um, uh, some endurance in the six minute walk, balance and, and so on. The participants, participants also do some patient reported outcomes. Uh, we do the physical function domain of the SF36, which is a, a 10 question uh, short questionnaire. Uh, we do the physical function domain also of the PROMISE and we use the computerized adaptive test. So that patient reported outcome, it has about 140 or 144 questions in it. But what it does is it, it it looks at the response to the first question and determines what questions are asked next. And it tries to uh, categorize people into, basically give you a, a, a fit where you are on a normative sort of database um, by answering about six to seven questions in total. Um, so it's a, an adaptive test. So it, it reduces the, uh, the time to complete the test. Uh, we do collect the international physical activity questionnaire um, we have subjects fill out that. Um, and we do ask participants whether they've fallen in the last 12 months. So we do a 12 months uh, falls recall. And as part of that, if they say yes, then we get some uh, information about those falls in terms of the circumstances, uh, where it was, uh, where they landed, uh, whether they had to go to, um, to the ER or so on. And like Dr. Mo said, all this data that we collect, the physical performance and the patient report outcomes, uh, or entered into Encore, an Encore database, and then it's all linked with the electronic me medical records. So someone could come along and say, you know, I'm looking for grip strength in people aged 50 to 60 years of age, uh, white females, um, and, and so on. We can pull that sort of data um, and potentially also pull that uh, the electronic medical record data as well, which we'll talk about more about in a little bit. So a lot of the subjects who have come through or participants who have come through have been normal, healthy subjects off the street, uh, just by word of mouth and, and recruiting. And so in, in, a, in those subjects, um, we wanted to develop some normative data. And so this is uh, uh, data for females. I think it's about 1400 females um, where we uh, worked out the centile curves for grip strands five times uh, sit to stand test, 30 seconds sit to stand test, uh, and we've done it for the other outcomes as well. And in these normal people, um, they were self reported normal uh, in a sense that they were self reported healthy. We verified that in over half of them by checking medical records for uh, uh, codes for chronic illness, disease, and medications just to verify that yes, they were healthy, uh, self reported health, no healthy normal. So we created these centile curves and We've also developed a, um, a physical performance scorecard that we provide participants now. One of the questions that a lot of physicians had who were even sending subjects or participants through the fit core was, you know, do we get the data? How do we know what's normal? Do we get the information? Does it go in their medical records? And so based on the centile curves from the healthy normals, uh, we've developed a, a, a physical performance scorecard that's Excel based that if you enter uh, someone's uh, age, uh, sex, and uh, the data they're testing and their performance, then it will plot their performance on, the, on, a, on a printable um, scorecard. So for this particular 65-year-old you know, female, based on their performance, 
uh, you can see that they're just above the, the median for their age. Um, and it actually gives you Z scores and T scores for, for the grip strength, uh, for five time repeat chair stand and 30 second uh, repeat chair stand. So you can potentially look um, and see where, where you're performing relative to people your age and your sex. And so participants uh, like this, particularly when they're well above normal. Um, we also <laughs> print this out in a PDF format and, it, and enter it into uh, their electronic medical record. So it gets linked um, with their medical record so that physicians can actually pull it and see uh, the, their, their patient's performance. So that's the function type side of things. Uh, in addition to the, the physical function testing, uh, everyone who comes through has a, a DEXA scan. Uh, we do whole body, um, DEXA, lean mass, um, or fat-free um, uh, tissue, uh, percent body fat. Um, we work out appendicular lean mass and also get spine and hip bone density. Uh, we're using the Norland Elite Scanner um, because one of the things that we really wanted to look at was appendicular lean mass. And what we found when we first started out on the first, I think 700 or so subjects was that about 25% of the people who came through had a BMI above 30. And then another 25% were above uh, a BMI above 25. So we, we had nearly 50% of our subjects uh, in that sort of obese and, and overweight category. And, and that fits the graphics of Midwest sort of Indianapolis. But what was happening was that we were not able to get appendicular lean mass in these subjects on a traditional DEXA scanner uh, because they didn't fit in the field of view or their arms were superimposed with their trunk and so on. So we changed to the Norland Elite uh, so that we could get better appendicular lean mass measures. Um, and you can scan you know, a subject up to 600 pounds on, a, on, the, on this scanner. Uh, you can put their arms out to the side. It, it has a much wider, basically a, a, the double the size of the field of view than a traditional uh, DEXA scanner. When we submitted the, the P30 grant, uh, we said that you know, if, we, if we get this grant funded, um, that we would buy a HRP QCT machine. And we said that in the actual grant as, um, and so when we were funded, we then had to go and find money to buy a HRP QCT. And, and fortuitously, or, or not fortuitous, but you know, being in Indiana, it's a very collaborative sort of uh, uh, environment. Uh, six different groups on campus uh, pitched in and chipped in to buy the HRP QCT. Um, and, and this was from a number of different schools, uh, administration and, and CTSI and so on. Um, so we raised the money to be able to buy uh, the scanner. And if you don't know uh, what a HR PCT is, it's a high resolution uh, CT scanner. It's about 10 times high resolution than a standard clinical CT scanner. So you can, the resolution is down to 61 microns or 0 0.06 millimeters uh, resolution. So it's very high resolution that you can image uh, pretty much individual trabeculae in bone. And it's peripheral because it's designed for distal radius and, and distal uh, tibia or uh, the leg bones. You can, you can get a little bit higher. You can put someone in a bit further. So you can get up to elbows and knees if you really want to push the limits. But it gives you true volumetric density. Uh, you can see in these images um, that you can, you can get three-dimensional measures of trabecular architecture uh, in terms of thickness and number and spacing um, and orientation. Uh, you can get cortical thickness, good measures of cortical thickness. And you can also apply a, um, a force to the bone mathematically and work out using finite element modeling, uh, predict how strong the bone is to a, to a compressive force. So um, the software these days that comes with the system can, can now uh, give you a predicted strength of the bone. So, so we've been trying to scan as many people as possible, possible on, the, on this scanner. It's primarily a research machine, uh, which means that there's not very good normative data for it. So a lot of subjects who come through, they want to know, you know, how does it look? Uh, you know, where am I, what's my standing on that, on the, on the CT outcomes? And we don't really have an answer because it's primarily a research tool um, without any normative data. So what we've done is, is tried to recruit as many healthy normals as possible and create a normative database uh, for, for the outcome measures. And these are just some of the example um, normative curves for cortical density, uh, cortical thickness, trabecular, and so on, porosity. 
um, and then failure load down the bottom right. Um, so you can see that sort of trend with age um, at the, and these are distal radius um, measures that how it changes across the, the sort of lifespan. And so we've created this uh, sort of normative data and centile curves and similar to what we've done with the functional outcome measures, uh, we've created a, uh, a workbook where you can enter someone's age um, and a couple of other demographic characteristics into the HRPTCT data um, into the first page of the worksheet. And then on the next page, it will plot uh, centile curves and give you uh, Z scores and T scores and so on for individual subjects uh, that come through. Um, so you know, this data and, uh, has, has been submitted recently, so hopefully it will uh, get published soon and, and this um, tool will be downloadable as a supplemental file with the manuscript. So that's the imaging side of things. Um, I'm not sure, um, Dr. Morrow, are you gonna take over? Okay, you, can play, you can play, hit this. Play this, okay. So before I play this, I, I should, preference it. So um, like I said, the data that we collect, uh, the uh, physical function testing and the imaging data, uh, primarily the DEXA data, the, the, H, the CT data is not uploaded into an online database yet, but the physical function and the DEXA data um, is uploaded onto Encore. Um, and then we've created a Tableau uh, database uh, that is searchable. And, and that's what this video is talking about. Um, and I'll play it now. And, hopefully make some sense there. Well, here we go. Here we go. This course Tableau dashboard collects all fit course subjects, demographic, physical function, and bone imaging data. This dashboard was created to help us navigate our study data. In this first step, we can easily monitor enrollment by gender, race and ethnicity, age, and we can also look at BMI, alcohol use, and smoking habits. In the second tab, we collect the physical function test results, including chair stands, time to complete, five reps, num number of chair stands in 30 seconds, distance walk in two minutes, distance walk in six minutes, usual and fast gait speed, best hand grip strength, promise physical function T score. Here we can easily filter our database for specific physical function test results and demographic characteristics of our subject. And this allows us to perform a fast feasibility analysis for investigators that are using our core who are looking for specific characteristics in their study population. The same goes for the BMD tab, where we collect the bone mineral density results including whole body BMD T and Z score, total femur BMD T and Z score, and femoral neck BMD and spine BMD. So let's see how this works. Let's say that we want to look at subjects at their first visit who are female, between 20 and 45 year of age of any race or ethnicity who have a total femur T-score of minus one or less. So we select this column. So here we have it. We can say that we have 74 subjects who have participated in our study so far with these characteristics. And here you have the disability study. This dashboard is constantly in evolution, as you can see from these additional tabs here. We are constantly adding new features and tools as we see they are needed to better serve the core and its users. OK, 
Okay, so I'll take back over again. This is Sharon Mo. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the tissue part of the Fit Core. So every patient that comes into the Fit Core gets blood drawn for serum, plasma, and then um, a pellet collected for is future isolation of DNA. Um, the only time that we don't draw <clears throat> the blood is if the patient's part of another research study where we uh, achieve the maximum amount of blood. Um, to be collected. We also are, proact are prospectively collecting musculoskeletal tissues from orthopedic surgeries, um, including synovium, cartilage, uh, and bone and muscle. And then we, right before COVID hit, we actually did training to um, do the vastus lateralis muscle biopsy. So we have some healthies. Unfortunately, uh, we had over 10 people get trained in it and we were hoping to continue to collect um, healthy normals. We are also beginning to collect muscle samples from abdominal surgeries as well. Um, so the opportunities that this provides is that we have samples collected at the time of enrollment. So we have plasma serum and pellet. And remember, everything in the fit core is collected to clinical disease information. So they not only get whatever you need from the, the electronic health record, but you also get the phenotype that we just went through, the physical function test, the bone density, lean mass, and HRP QCT. So for example, you could get um, you know, plasma levels. You could have some uh, for a unique biomarker and you want to compare patients who have low and high physical performance on tests or low and high bone density or that have cortical porosity and do not. So all of these can be done pretty easily and you can even then uh, move the patient sample into a specific disease state. Um, at Indiana University, we have a very strong center for musculoskeletal health and the, um, a lot of basic scientists. So we have been working very hard to try to get them to measure their favorite um, assay um, and to maybe look at DNA in order to actually have some human component of their basic science. Initially, when we put in the grant, there was pending funding to get GWAS of all the samples. Unfortunately, that fell through, but we are still looking for someone to volunteer to do that in case any, some, anyone has that availability uh, on this call. <clears throat> so similar to the Tableau, one of the important things is getting the samples accessible. And at Indiana University, we have a very active and large biobank, particularly for neural tissues, brains, um, blood, DNA for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other diseases. So we have a catalog that you can access from the outside. So you ask us for access. There's a quick screening, kind of like an I am not a robot for um, other activities. And then we give you access to do feasibility analyses. So let's explain how that works. age for 60 to 
and I will filter sex for female and race for black or African American. So here you can see we have 23 records. That means that we have 23 serum samples from um, female African American between the age of 16 and 70 years old. So now we can download our filter data and we will uh, obtain an Excel spreadsheet that we can use to send a request to the Fit Core. But let's say that we also want white female a same age range because we want to compare the expression of a serum biomarker between the two populations. So here we will filter for both African American and white. And now we have 341 serum samples available. Now we probably will not want all 341 samples for our study. So in this case, we can select only the samples that we want. So let's say we want this many And here we go to download selected this time. So only samples that we have selected will be included in our spreadsheet. And now here we have our table. And this is the table that we will use to send a request to the fit core. So um, as Dr. Uh, Warden went through in the beginning, we were quite challenged around the COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, and are still from that with increased time needed between participants to clean. Uh, we are starting to get a little bit more of an uptick as people are getting vaccinated, um, but it was a real challenge. We were on a major roll here and then have been plateaued. Um, we also have been challenged for enrollment, low enrollment of children. We tried uh, after hours and weekends. Uh, we actually recruited from um, many of the subspecialty clinics and again, tried to get those participants, those investigators engaged. And then we are particularly challenged with low enrollment of more diverse um, participants as well as illustrated by that video and by our numbers of uh, black and African-American versus the white. And this is particularly important for our physical performance and our scorecards where we need normative data by race. Um, so that's a focus of our current attention. And we're working with our CTSI uh, Community Engagement Corps to try to enhance that. So as we've been saying throughout this linked, um, this, these data that are collected are linked to um, clinical data. So we are um, blessed in Indiana for having the largest uh, network for patient care um, called the INPC. Uh, this is managed through something called the Indiana Health Information Exchange. So data that is dumped into this exchange is from more than 80 healthcare systems, uh, payer data, including Medicaid and many other um, private insurers. And we also have pharmacy data. So it's not just what was prescribed, but what was actually um, filled. This information is then linked to the INPC, where we also have a linkage of the Social Security uh, death data. Um, that then goes into the Reagan Street data core. So Reagan Street is a public, uh, sorry, is a private um, partner of the universities, um, and they serve as the honest data broker for all of this for research purposes. So for clinical purposes, we can easily access this for patients that we see to get information about 
things, maybe that they had a blood draw at a different hospital system. For research, of course, we need to have the appropriate data use agreements. And the beauty is that the Reagan Street Data Corps takes care of all that for investigators. So in addition to the INPC data, we also get much more um, specific data from our major two healthcare systems, including IU Health and Eskenazi that the university is in the School of Medicine is associated with. So there is uh, a group of individuals called um, Data Corps um, that actually mine the data for us. And in fact, they built the Tableau as well. So the INPC receives data from over two thirds of Indiana residents and it's closer to 84%. Um, it was rapidly ramped up during the COVID pandemic to allow for a statewide COVID um, database called Cortico. So the type of the data um, and the ease of extraction depends on the type of data. So the easy things to get out include um, that on the left column, so age, gender, race, zip code. It's a geocode, so we can only get the first three numbers in a zip code. And then diagnoses by ICD code, which is your billing code or a mix of them. We can also do a numeric uh, ranking, the primary diagnosis uh, listed by the clinical provider. And we can get medications dispensed. So the moderate uh, things that are a little bit harder to get are what we call encounters, which includes outpatient visits, hospitalizations, care provider, care locations, and then what we call standard definitions of disease. So this is part of what we're doing in our um, FIT core as well, sorry, is developing the computable phenotypes. And I'll explain that in a minute. The system, Reagan Street, has also developed what they call vending machine diagnoses. Um, and so these are previously validated for many different diseases, <clears throat> as I'll explain. We also get um, death. Um, it was really easy before 2015, and then Social Security changed the way that they give the data, and we're now back into getting it more easily. We can get laboratory tests. Um, this is a little hard from the contributing hospitals. Um, and there's different methods and different normative values in different units, and then vital signs. So very hard to get out are actually comorbidities. Um, we can do natural language processing and actually pull out uh, statements from the clinical notes, but it's very time consuming. We do have some genetic testing. Um, in addition, we have been able to link to a database in the IU Health Radiology Department called Doris that actually can give us the true radiograph if someone wants to re-image some of those scans. So what is a computable phenotype? Well, um, for those of you that have done health service type research, you know that the data that is in a clinical database is not nearly as perfect as data collected for a prospective clinical trial where everyone codes things in the same way. So you really don't wanna just rely on billing codes. Um, so a group of variables is going to be superior to any one variable, and that's what we call a computable phenotype. So for example, you might define diabetes as a hemoglobin A1C greater than six, or an ICD code, or a diabetes medication dispensed, but if you have all of these, then your diagnosis is gonna be much more specific and sensitive. Um, we also have then, as a course of this grant, we have um, developed new um, computable phenotypes. So one included refining the diabetes a little bit. The other included chronic kidney disease, which we refined. And then fractures. We actually found that the ICD codes, when we add insurance claims on top of ICD code, we actually get about 8% more in terms of numbers of fractures. So that the code just shows the errors in coding. Um, as Dr. Warden explained, we also um, took patients and described them as healthy if they had no medications prescribed from a doctor, but they actually had a doctor visit in the last two years. We looked at the number of individuals who have used the code for exercise prescription, either in the code or in natural language processing. And then Dr. Emil, collaborator on our grant here, has, is looking at sarcopenia. And then we've also started on falls. So these are ways that we're trying to use the electronic health record to give us a better phenotype. And that will then be able to be linked to either any of our collected tissue or blood samples or to any of the data that Dr. Warden went through. So we'll go ahead and stop there. So we have plenty of time for questions. Um, this is the contact information for all of us individually. But if you really wanna know more, then you can just email infofit 
um, for the information for the FIT course, so infofit at iu.edu. Um, the important thing is, is that this is a core and we really want more people to use the resources that we've built up. So if you are doing as a musculoskeletal investigator or as cores where you're advising people on musculoskeletal disease research, we are happy to help. So if they need data on a certain assay in patients with lower high BMD, or if they are want to do longitudinal data on HR, if they want to look at various time points in um, or various other um, information related to musculoskeletal health, we can do that as part of our core services. So we look to all of you to try to help us disseminate this information more broadly than we've been able to. Um, so we appreciate your time. I'm happy to entertain any questions. So just to remind everybody, if you have any questions for Dr. Warden or Dr. Mo, you can unmute yourself and ask it, or you can type it in the chat box and I will read it aloud. Hi, this is Richard Loser. I have a question. Sure. Um, actually, in, I visited, uh, visited your center virtually a few <laughs> weeks ago and gave a okay. talk, um, which was, was, was a lot of fun. The um, tissue that you're getting um, from orthopedic surgery, mm -hmm. is that connected with um, the clinical and functional data that you also have, or is it separate? So it's connected to the electronic health records, but it's not collected, not connected to the fit core unless they happen to have gone through it. So we're trying to get the people, the, we're trying to get the surgeons to actually utilize um, the fit core before preoperatively mm -hmm. would be ideal. Uh, but at this point we have, it's not connected in that way, but the health information is connected. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned having some data from healthy individuals. How confident are you that they are defined as such? And then how do you define a healthy individual when you're collecting data? Yeah, we argued a lot about this in the beginning because um, the self-report is interesting and probably a study in itself because a lot of people said they were healthy, but they were taking a medication. And then you could argue, well, if you're taking a medication, for example, for high cholesterol, um, is that mean that you're not healthy or does that just mean that you're actually taking medicine proactively so, or, or um, for um, preventive care? So that's why we kind of double checked and most of the people that were self-reported healthy had not had a new prescription in two years and really uh, were not on uh, chronic medications other than PPIs, anti -hyper, um, PPIs uh, maybe a low dose of uh, SSRI and also um, uh, preventive kind of medicine, vitamins, et cetera. So as good as we can get, I think. Great, thank you. And Dr. Rubin has a question as well. Hi, Sharon and, Hi. and Stuart, C can you hear me? Yes. Um, I wondered whether any of the data you're collecting will help to make some kind of a frailty index that could be easily performed and transmitted into the patient chart? So actually the, um, so the sarcopenia, or actually Eric's on, so he could probably comment further. Hi, but, Eric. <laughs> yeah. So the, actually that's the subject of an R1 that Eric has. So why don't I let him explain? <laughs> so actually we, one of the things that we're doing um, with my, uh, with the uh, sarcopenia grant is we're, taking patients who have been at the, in the fit core and using their fit core measurements as um, uh, objective measures uh, in support of uh, sarcopenia using um, definitions like the FNIH definition or the, um, the much longer abbreviation that I always forget what all the letters are, EWGPOS, I think I got extra <laughs> ones in there now. Um, and um, using uh, machine learning techniques with information that's gathered from their health record um, with the goal of being able to identify who has sarcopenia, even if they don't have um, those measurements in their health records. So we'll see how that's going. Um, uh, we've, we've got a few different stages of that. Some of it's just using coded data, um, but we're also working on an um, algorithm that's going to pull text related data as well. The text is a lot harder um, than just using coded data. 
Well, Eric, I'd really be interested in that. Let me know when you know something and uh, get you to talk to us. <laughs> oh, fun. Thanks. <laughs> And you know, we're using some of the definitions. So in the beginning, for example, um, Stuart was able to categorize by, I think it was 15 year age ranges, people who are at the bottom for all the physical function measures or at the top uh, quartile for all the physical function measures. So you get low and high performers across the age span and we have the blood in that. So I think it's interest, um, really interesting to see how that fits for a lot of different um, blood assays that we use on an initial span from our basic scientists. You know, just sitting here thinking about your, you know, what your core can do. I wonder if you guys could quickly um, get it up and running and study long COVID. Yeah, actually, we're doing that. <laughs> we're yeah, doing that. But all this stuff is so obvious. So yeah. when are you gonna know something about that? <laughs> I don't know. So we actually, um, our uh, CTSI, we had collected people, um, every COVID positive patient, and then we crossed that with our fit four and we ended up with about 70 patients, not a huge number, but we'll have a pre-post in those 70. And then we have about um, 500 more that are COVID positive patients who volunteered to be called back for research and we're calling all of them to come in the fit four. So at least we'll have 70 pre -posts. That's really well, um, appointed to do a lot of really yeah. important research. We just put in one of those awful, god awful past grants that I'm sure everybody else on this call yeah, had. Yeah, God, they're just horrendous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so please help us spread the word. Um, we really, you know, the getting all this infrastructure set up obviously took us a while, but we have all these resources and it would be a shame to not get them used across the country by investigators. So um, info fit, nice way to do. Yeah, thanks, that's terrific. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.